Hello everyone, welcome back. So today we'll take up some more problems from kinematics. So this is first question. So we have a stone that is projected from the edge A and it hits the ground at the point C, moving almost vertically. So this is an important point over here. So when the stone is about to hit the ground, it is almost vertical, meaning its horizontal velocity is zero. Now the reason for this strange behavior is air resistance that is proportional to the speed of the stone. Okay, so we have some kind of air resistance force, uh, which is proportional to the speed of the particle. Now it's given that the points A and B or the trajectory are at the same horizontal level, time taken by the stone in its upward and downward motions above the level B differ by an amount of delta t. So let's say this is the maximum height guys. So let's call this point as D. So the time taken to go from A to D and from D to B differ by an amount of delta t. Uh, the moduli of vertical component of the velocities at point A and B differ by delta Vy. Uh, horizontal component of the velocity at point A is ux. So and horizontal displacement of the stone from A to C is capital R. Okay, so this distance from A to C is equal to capital R. Now denoting the acceleration due to gravity by G, we have to figure out a suitable expression for the maximum height of the stone above the horizontal level AB. So from the horizontal level AB, we need to find the H max in terms of the given quantities. Okay, so this is a rough diagram of the situation. So we project a stone from the point A and the point on the same level is point B and finally the ball terminates at point C. And this distance and the horizontal distance between A and C is given to be capital R. Okay, so again, we'll just start by observing what are the forces acting on the stone. So let's, let's take some arbitrary point on the trajectory of the ball. So let's call this point as point P. Now as when the stone reaches this particular point, its velocity, the direction of its velocity vector will be along the tangent to the curve at this particular point, right? And let's say its magnitude is V, so we're going to call it as V vector. Okay, so now air resistance will act exactly opposite to the velocity vector. And let's say its magnitude is B times V vector. Okay, in vector form, it will be minus B V vector. Okay, and then we have G vector acting vertically downwards. So first, let's write down the vector equation of the motion of the stone. So we can say net force would be equal to mg uh, vector minus B times V vector. Okay, again, the minus sign signifies that the air resistance force is opposite to the velocity vector. Okay, so now we, from here we can write down acceleration is nothing but g vector minus some other constant times v vector. Okay guys, so now this is a vector equation that we have. So we cannot write this as dv vector by dt and then divide both sides by g minus kv and then integrate because we cannot divide vectors, right? So what we have to do is if you guys want to integrate it, then you have to break it down into components. So we'll take the components. So ax equals gx minus k times of vx and ay equals gy minus k times of vy. Okay, so now this has become a scalar equation because we just compared the i cap components and the j cap components separately. So basically gx would be zero because uh, g is acting in the y direction, right? And then you can solve the differential equation. So that is one way of doing it. But okay, so now let's write the acceleration vector as the rate of change of velocity vector. So this would be equal to g vector minus kv vector. We'll take the dt and send it to the other side. So on the left hand side, we get dv vector. And on the right hand side, we get g vector dt minus k times v vector dt. So now, now what we're going to do is integrate this expression. Now again, so okay, this is v vector, not a component of it, right? So if you integrate dv vector, we'll get delta v vector, which is basically the change in velocity vector. And on the right hand side, we get g vector times the total time t minus k times. Now guys, if, we, if you integrate the velocity vector with respect to time, we will get the displacement vector. So this will just become the net displacement vector. Okay, so now again, a lot of information has been given to us. So we'll use those uh, informations one by one. Okay, so first let's just analyze the motion from A to D, which means the starting point to the maximum height. And guys, the interesting point about the point D is that uh, as it's the maximum height point, the vertical velocity at the point D is equal to zero. Okay, now guys, as this is a vector equation, there will be I cap, J cap components both. So we are only going to take the J cap components because we want to use this information over here, right? So the Y cap version of that equation will be, so we can say Delta V Y equals G vector has a magnitude of G and it's in the direction of minus J cap. Okay. And I'm assuming again, downward direction is negative, upward direction is positive. And then we have minus K times. Now the J cap component of the displacement vector will be basically S Y, which is the displacement in the Y direction. Okay. So now observe the motion between point A and point D guys. So when the ball reaches the topmost point, the VY would be zero. So final VY is zero. Initial VY, let's just assume it is UY, okay? And it'll be UY in the J cap direction. Okay, so now we have to choose the time. So let's say the time taken to go from A to D, okay, is T1. 
So this is going to be GT1 in the minus J cap direction. Now, this is the displacement vector, guys. So the Y component of the displacement vector is equal to H J cap, right? So now let's get rid of the J cap and rearrange it a bit. Okay, so this is our equation number one. Okay, so now let's observe the motion from D to B. Okay, so again, we'll apply the same equation. So, so now let's say the vertical velocity at the point B is, uh, let's say V dash. Okay, so the final VY is going to be V dash in the minus J cap direction okay, and minus the initial velocity as our initial point is point D, initial vertical velocity would be zero. And this would be equal to minus G J cap times the total time. So now, now the time here is the time taken to go from D to point B. Now for this, what we can do is assume that the total time of flight is T2. And we know from A to D, the time taken was T1. So we can write the time taken to go from D to B as T2 minus T1. Okay, so this is going to be T2 minus T1. Again, T2 is the time taken to go from A to B. Here, if you observe the displacement vector is from D to B. So the vertical component is going to be minus H J cap. Okay, so the displacement vector is minus H J cap. So this is the second equation that we get. Now guys, when the stone is ascending, right, the air resistance BV is in the direction of gravity. I mean, the Y component of it is supporting gravity, right? So it will decelerate super fast and it will come to rest and it will reach the maximum height extremely fast. When the ball is descending, let's say, let's take a point, something like this. Here, BV vector will be in this direction, whereas gravity is in this direction. Here, the rate at which the ball is accelerating downwards is less than G. Initially, it was greater than G. So basically, the ball will decelerate fast from A to D, and then it will accelerate very slow from D to B, which means the time taken to go from A to D is smaller in comparison to the time taken from D to B. So in short, the time taken from A to D, let's say if it is equal to T1, which we took, right? Then the time taken to go from D to B is going to be T1 plus delta T. How did I write this? Because it's given that the difference in these two times is delta T. And I also know that TAD is smaller, right? So I took TAD as T1 and TDB as T1 plus delta T. Now guys, instead of this uh, T2 minus T1, what we can do is directly substitute it as TDB because we know TDB is T1 plus delta T, right? So instead of T2 minus T1, we can just write it as T1 plus delta T. Okay, so this is our second equation. Okay guys, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract equation 2 from equation 1. So on the left hand side, we get UY minus V dash. Right hand side, the, G del the GT1 cancels out and we get a minus G delta T. The On the left hand side, we have VY minus V dash. So which is basically, now it's, now this is not VY, this is UY. So UY is the initial Y velocity and V dash is the Y velocity at point B. The difference of these two quantities is what they gave in the question as delta VY. So this thing we can replace with the given quantity delta VY. Okay, so from here, the height H turns out to be divided by 2K. Now the only variable here is K and for that we'll use this information given to us in the question that the distance between A and C is capital R. Now, if you observe, this is the X displacement, right? So we'll, so we'll convert this into the X component equation. So the LHS will become uh, delta VX, the right hand side. Now there is no G in the X direction. So that we will just omit. And then we'll have minus K times SX. So this is the, so this is the X component equation. Now guys, uh, in the, in the question, they, they provided that when the ball finally falls to the ground, it falls almost vertically. Now what that means is the, the X component velocity at the point C is zero. So in delta Vx, the final velocity is zero. The initial velocity was given as ux in the question. This would be equal to minus k times the displacement in x direction, which is plus r i cap. And from here, we get k as ux divided by r. And this is what they were asking. So now we finally got h as a function of all the given variables. Okay. Basically, the concept that is useful in this question is the utilization of this vector equation. So yeah, that's about it for this question. Now let's move to the next question. Okay, so now let's move to the 17th question. So here we have three boys, A, B and C, who decide to walk on straight tracks parallel to a power line. So this is the enlarged diagram. Boys A and B walk on the same track, while boy C walks on a different, different track in the same direction with velocities 4, 2 and 2. So basically B and C are moving with 2 meter per second and A is moving with 4 meter per second. The track of boys A and B is equidistant from the power line. Okay, so this is the power line that they're talking about. And uh, this distance is also D and this distance is also D. In the beginning, all the boys and one of the poles are in a line that is perpendicular to the power line. 
which means boys AB and then boys C is along this particular line over here. So basically we have to draw the graph to show how the number of poles that the boy C can see through the space between boys A and B vary with time. So basically uh, the question is that, uh, of course guys, the boy B will be slower, right? So let's say at some point of time, boy B is over here. Let's say the boy A is somewhere over here. Now C and B has the same speed. So C will be right under B. Now, as you can see, there is some gap between boy A and boy B. So basically boy C is observing the poles from these gaps. Okay, and as you can see, he can can see one pole over here. So the question is, what is the function? How is this function varying with time? Basically the number of poles versus time. So we have to figure out how this is varying. Okay. Oh yeah. And one more thing, the distance between the poles are 18 meters. Okay. So the pole to pole separation is 18 meters. Okay. So now let's begin with the analysis. Okay. So let's say this is the diagram guys. And I'm basically representing the poles with a red dot. Okay. Okay. And again, the distance between any two adjacent red dots is 18 meters. Okay. okay so now let's draw the tracks. So let's say this, mm, this track I drew in the middle is where boy A and B are walking. And this track over here is where boy C is walking. So now let's analyze everything after a time T. So after a time T, boy will boy A who was present over here will cover a distance of speed into time, which is 2T, right? So this distance is going to be 2T. Okay, and similarly, the boy B who is traveling with four meter per second will cover double the distance. He will be at a distance of 40 from the starting point. Okay, now guys, similarly, the boy C will be right under boy A because both of their speeds are the same, right? Okay, so this is their instantaneous locations after a time of T. So A and C are right on this word horizontal level and B is 2T in front of them. Okay, so now the question is what fraction of the uh, you know, upper layer can the can the boy C see. So for that, what we can do is we can. So basically, the boy C can see everything in between these two paths. So for that, what I'm doing is I'm drawing two extreme rays, something like this. So this represents the gap in between boy A and B and the boy C can see everything from from this point to this point. Right. So let's try to figure it out mathematically. So this distance AB over here is equal to 2T, right? 40 minus 2T, it'll be 2T. So now from similarities of triangle, we can see that if you observe this small triangle and the bigger triangle, the bigger triangle is just the smaller triangle, but just 2 x right? So like, for example, this, D, this length is D and for the bigger triangle, this length is 2D, which means even this length will be doubled for the bigger triangle. So this length over here will be equal to 40. So basically our boy can see everything between X equals 2T till X equals 60. So like in this situation, there are two balls. So the answer will be two. So now basically all we have to observe is this line 2T and this line 60. Okay. Basically boy C can see everything in between X equals 2T to X equals 60, right? So this vertical line is at X equals 2T and this particular location is at X equals to 60. Okay. So once we know this information, what we can do is we can bring in two lines. Let's say first we bring a green line and let's call it line number one. And after that, let's bring a yellow line. Okay. And let's call this as line number two. Okay. And I'm going to call the coordinate of line number two as 60 and the coordinate of line number one as 2T. The, um, basically the entire region in between these two will be visible to boy number C. So now all we have to do is just analyze these two lines and report the number of balls in between. So so another interesting observation is that the front line travels with a speed of six meters per second and the back line travels with a speed of two meter per second. So the yellow line is three times as fast as the green line. Okay. So basically guys, when time t equal to zero, both the lines are at the first pole. And so basically we'll report the number of poles seen as zero in this case. And just after some delta t seconds, uh, line one and line two will be like this and we won't see any poles here right? The first interesting point will happen when the line two reaches the second pole, because just after it reaching the second pole, one pole will start becoming visible, right? So when does the front line reach the second pole? So that's pretty easy to figure out, right? So we know the distance traveled by the front line is six into T. So we want this to be equal to 18 meters, right? Because the pole to pole separation is 18 meters. So from here, the time T turns out to be three seconds. So the front line, it jumps from pole to pole every three seconds. Okay, so it keeps jumping from pole to pole every three seconds. So for the line on the back, it'll be 2t equals 18 meters, which means t equal to nine seconds. So the line on the back takes nine seconds to jump from pole to pole, which is like three times more than the time taken for the second line. Okay, so basically from t equals zero to three seconds, we will see zero poles. Okay, because there is a, in, in that time frame there is no poles in between these two, right? And the moment time t equals 
three seconds. Uh, what happens at three seconds? The second line would reach the second pole, right? And just after three seconds, it will cross the first pole, right? So the first line will be somewhere over here. And now, as you can see, one of those poles is visible. Till when is it visible? Till the second line reaches the second pole. Okay, and that happens at six seconds. And in si and at six seconds, the first line is still somewhere to the left of the second pole. So basically, from three to six seconds we can see one pole, which is basically this pole over here. And you know, right after t equal to six second mark, this second line will cross third pole. And after that, we can see two poles. So from t equals six seconds onwards. Now, till when is it two seconds? So the next interesting time frame is nine seconds, right? So at nine seconds, the second line will reach the third ball. But here, another interesting thing happens. So we know at nine seconds, first line also reaches an, reaches one of those poles, right? So line one will be reaching this pole. So guys, just before this instant, how many poles were visible? Two poles were visible, right? And just after this instant, the line two will cross this pole, okay? And we can see plus one pole. But the thing is, the line one will cross a second pole. So there will be minus one pole as well. So here, as you can see, it won't be three poles, but the answer will be two poles because the line one deletes this pole, whereas line two adds this pole. So the thing is the plus one minus one cancels each other out and we still have two poles. So yes, from six to nine, we can see two poles, okay? But from nine to 12 also, we can see two poles. Okay, and the reason for that is the, the green line reaching one of those poles. Okay, and again, the pattern continues at, at 12 seconds, the second line will be over here. And just after 12 seconds, this guy will be somewhere over here. And we can see three poles from t equal to 12 to 15, we can see three poles. And similarly, you guys can probably get the idea now from 15 to 18 seconds, uh, we can see four poles. Okay, so now here there is an interesting location. We again reach t equal to 18. And at t equal to 18, the first line will reach here. Second line will reach over here. Here, if you observe, you know, just before the lines reaching here, there are four poles that were visible. Now, just after this point, there will be again four poles that are visible. So this will be from eight, from 18 to 21 also, there will be four poles. So now basically, let's just write down the pattern observed. So what we observe is that each integral multiple of three, like three, six, nine, 12, etc., the pole number is increased by one. After the first three seconds, it is one. After six seconds, it is two. But the thing is, except at multiples of nine. And at these locations where um, the time is an integral multiple of nine, the pole number does not change. As you can see, the at time t equal to nine seconds, just before also the pole number was two and just after also it is two only, right? Okay, so now let's try to draw a graph of this. Okay, so again, the graph is between the time versus number of poles visible to boy C. So, so from t equal to zero to t equal to three, the, the boy can't see any pole. And from three seconds to six seconds, the boy can see one pole. So this would be a jump discontinuity, right? And from six seconds to nine seconds, the boy can see two poles. And, uh, and now as we are at a multiple of nine seconds, the number does not change. So it will still be two. So, and from nine seconds to 12 seconds, again, the number will be just two. Okay, so now I'm not continuing drawing the graph, but once I, once we reach 12, it'll jump to another height. And now three poles will be visible till 12 to 15. And, and after 15 seconds, we'll see four poles uh, and we'll see, keep seeing it till 18 seconds. Now, as we again reach a multiple of nine, the number does not change and we'll still see four poles. And after 21 seconds, we'll see five poles, so on and so forth. So this will be just like a kind of like a greater percentage of function. Okay. So that's how the curve looks like guys. So yeah, that's about it for this question. Okay guys. So that was it for this video. If you enjoyed the video, please do like share and subscribe. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.